church. Today we find ourselves in Proverbs chapter 9. And so if you have a Bible with you, whether it be in paper or digital form, I encourage you to turn there now. In today's conversation, uh, we are going to unpack what the Bible has to say about interacting with foolish people. Today's topic, guidance for rebuking foolish people. Friends, I don't know if you've ever encountered someone in your life who you would consider to be foolish. Maybe somebody who makes unwise or often self-destructive situations or decisions. I don't know if you've ever found yourself in a situation where you have maybe observed foolish behavior being on display and you've, and you've had wrestled with this, maybe this internal struggle, like, should I say something, right? Should I step into this situation and, and offer my perspective on it? What should I do, Lord? You know, church, do we as Christians have a kingdom responsibility to rebuke foolish people? You know, do we have an, a moral obligation to correct people's stupidity? Now, we don't, in, in our house, by the way, we, there was one word we didn't let our kids say. It was the S word, and it's not the word that you think. It, it's, it's stupidity. So I'm, I'm using it. I'm breaking a family rule. But do we have a responsibility when we see someone who's acting or saying something that is st- stupid? What's our responsibility? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. That's what the Bible really addresses today here in Proverbs chapter 9. And so if you take a look at it with me, today we're going to look at really two guidance tips that I invite you to ponder, guidance for rebuking foolish, foolish people. So go to verse verse 7 of Proverbs chapter 9. This is what we read. Anyone who rebukes a mocker will get an insult in return. Anyone who corrects the wicked will get hurt. So don't bother correcting mockers. They will only hate you. But correct the wise and they will love you. Instruct the wise and they will be even wiser. Teach the righteous and they will learn even more. So guidance tip number one we find here in these first three verses. Friends, when you encounter someone who you judge to be foolish. Here in these Bible verses, the Bible really instructs us, or the Bible writer counsels us to hold our tongue. So guidance tip number one, save your breath. Save your breath. Proverbs 23 verse nine says, don't waste your breath on fools, for they will despise the wisest advice. You know, one of the ways I have determined at least and I've observed and maybe just by experience have, uh, that I evaluate a person, really the wisdom of a person, when I make a judgment about somebody, is how do they respond to criticism? How do they respond to constructive feedback? You know, we're told here in Proverbs chapter 9 that the foolish repudiate correction whereas the wise will welcome it. Mockers will hate you, verse 8 says, whereas the wise will love it. You know, when Jesus was here on this earth, during his earthly ministry, he had a group of 12 guys whom he loved, young men who he would invest his really time and energy into. And in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 10 to 11, we can read how Jesus... uh, Puts his, brings his disciples together and he, he, he puts them into really pairs, into two guys together and he sends them out on this sort of this preaching, teaching ministry uh, in, in groups of, of two. I don't know if you, it's a group of two in pairs of two, right? And in verses 10 and 11, Jesus gives his disciples this instruction or this advice as, as he sends them out. He says, if a town refuses to welcome you, So basically, if a town doesn't listen to what you have to say, he says, go out into the street and say, we wipe even the dust of our, of your town from our feet. You know, the Mary, the yellow brick road thing, you know, cook your teals together to show you that we have abandoned you to your fate. So basically, what is Jesus saying? He's really reinforcing this message that not everyone is going to be open to godly input. And so when you and I 
encounter those who turn a deaf ear to good godly counsel and display a lack of willingness to be open-minded and teachable or even give you the basic respect of listening to what you have to say, you are to save your breath. You know, I, I've shared this before publicly and I, I, it just brings to my mind again, you know, that, that Steve Mensinger and I, the first time we, really the interaction we had is we had a bit of a disagreement. We're both very in, intense people. And, 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 but, but I immediately loved, felt, had a tremendous amount of respect and love for Steve because not only did he express to his, me his opinion, but he gave me an opportunity to express mine too, right? And that's how you can tell if someone is wise or not, is will they at least, they may not agree with you, right? And right now in this world of, you know, the Supreme Court justice just made a big decision this past week and everybody's kind of put, popping off about their opinion. A lot of times we don't want to listen to what other people say even though, you know, we disagree with you. Wise people will at least give you the benefit of the doubt, and treat you with an element of respect to at least listen to what you say. That's what scripture says. In Proverbs chapter 26, verse 17, here's another good piece of advice that King Solomon offers. He says, interfering, now this is a big one, interfering in someone else's argument is as foolish as yanking a dog's ears. Are you familiar with that proverb? Interfering in someone else's argument is as foolish as grabbing or yanking a dog's ears. Translation, don't meddle in other people's arguments. When other people are fighting, don't butt in. Because what happens when you yank on a dog's ears? How's a dog going to respond? He's, he's going to bite your hand. We had an incident, and I shared this, I might have shared this, I'm sure, a couple weeks ago, where I had this dad was following, yelling at his kid coming across our parking lot. And it was, it was intense. And I pulled me out of my office because I could hear it, you know, through the office doors. I'm like, what's going on out here, you know, with this commotion? And I yanked the dog's ears. I, I stepped into a situation that was, I, I was living this. But I felt like I had a bit of a responsibility. He was on our campus, right? I didn't really know what the relationship was, was with this, this man yelling at this little kid, probably like seven years old. He was, and, and, and I made a judgment based upon how this dad looked, and, and it didn't go so well. Like, he immediately came over and, and confronted me and, and let me know uh, he didn't appreciate me meddling in his parenting. And Beto came out, and then he realized how, how crazy it was, and he went right back in. He didn't. <clears throat> I had my helmet, you know, I had my helmet in my hand, and I think, am I going to have to hit this guy in the head with this helmet? Like, it was, it was a potentially violent situation. But what I was reminded of instantly was this Bible verse. Now, I would do the same thing again. Because he was here on this campus, and I feel like I have a kingdom responsibility to steward what takes place on this campus, particularly when it involves a man yelling at a young, young kid. All the way from Wilson Street over here, you could hear him coming the whole way. But still, it reinforces this truth that when you yank on a dog's ears, you will likely get bit. And so, brothers and sisters, when you and I are interacting with foolish people, when people have their opinion about stuff, a lot of opinions right now. And they illustrate this unwillingness to hear another person's perspective. What the Bible writer is telling us is save your breath because it's not gonna make a difference. If anything, it's only gonna escalate things. Now hear me on this. Hear me very clearly. I'm not suggesting, I am not suggesting that you shouldn't help people. And you say, Mike, you're kind of confusing me. The Bible isn't advocating that we as followers of Jesus stand on the sidelines while, while people go to hell, okay? There's a, but there's this tension here. But what the Bible writer is advising us is that when you and I encounter a foolish person and we recognize that they are not going to change, they got their blinders on, they don't really want to even give you the respect that you need to, to at least listen to another perspective. And, and, and check your own heart on this, brothers and sisters. Then save your breath. You know, you've heard me say this a lot. A person won't change until they hurt enough that they have to. It's not until we hit rock bottom. It's not until I have my heart attack and I'm, and I'm on my, you know, that I change my diet, right? 
It's not until my wife walks out the door of me and says, I'm done, I, I, I can't tell you. You're not gonna treat me like that anymore when I stop back and go, whoa, maybe I should reevaluate what role I am as a, as a husband, right? People don't change until they hurt enough that they have to. And so when a person responds negatively to your input, save your breath and instead practice guidance tip number two, which is to focus your energy on those who want to learn. Focus your energy on those who want to learn. Now, before we unpack this second guidance tip, I want you to just pause with me and and we're going to say a prayer and ask God to help us be wise again. So again, take a deep breath, everybody. Inhale, exhale. Now just pray this. Say, Heavenly Father, please help me to be teachable. Please help me to be open to other people's input because I want to be wise. Now pray this. Say, Father, please increase my discernment. Please increase my discernment for knowing when I should speak and when I should hold my tongue. Let's say that again. Lord, please increase my discernment to know when I should speak and when I should hold my tongue. So good. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, let's keep reading. Verses 9 and 10. This is where we're going to see the second guidance tip. 9 through 11, but we'll start at verse 9. Instruct the wise and they will be even wiser. Teach the righteous and they will learn even more. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. So let me just stop here. Church, well done. For those of you who are here, for those of you who are tuning in online, well done because you are practicing what the Bible writer is saying is good advice. You're coming to Palm Harvest, you're listening to me flap my gums and you're you know, considering at least some of the things that I'm having to say. You're pondering them. You may not always agree with what I, what I express up here from the stage, but at least you're, you're saying, I wanna be in a place where I can be challenged, right? I wanna be in a place where maybe I can look at God's word and see what I can apply in my life. And the Bible says here that that's good, that there will be a fruitful, positive impact on your life for being here today, for tuning in today. So well done, okay? So verse 11, look at this. Wisdom will multiply your days and add years to your life. You wanna add longevity to your life? Come to Palm Harvest, right? (laughs) Verse 12, if you become wise, you will be the one to benefit. If you scorn wisdom, you will be the one to suffer. So what are we told here? We're told here that the wise listen, learn, and thereby prosper, whereas the foolish reject, disregard, and thereby suffer. So the fact that you're here today, the fact that you're tuning in today, the fact that you're in a place where you're saying, you know what, I want to learn, I want to sharpen my sword, is putting you in a place where you're going, you know what, God has an opportunity to prosper me. Show of hands, how many of you want to prosper? Yeah, we all do. That's why when dealing with foolish people, save your breath and focus your energy on those who want to learn. You know, Proverbs 12, verse 15, I'm going to read some verses for you here. It says, fools think they, their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Proverbs 17, verse 16, it is senseless to pay tuition to educate a fool since he has no heart for learning. So parents, if you're, you know, a lot of us parents want to, particularly because we come from a white collar community, we want to send our kids to school. And I always tell kids, you know, a, a degree is just like a movie ticket. You know, you go to the movie theater, you buy a movie ticket to go see Top Gun, for example. But if for some reason you want to go down and see Jurassic Park, no one's there checking. You can, you're into the theater. You could go just as easily. I'm not going to go to Top Gun. I'm going to go over here to Jurassic Park. All a, all a degree does is it gets you into the door and gives you the ticket to maybe make you set yourself apart from, from you know, 
your career path. And so, you know, Cole and Hunter, you guys, you know, have gone to school. You've just recently graduated. If you don't necessarily go, and this, hopefully this is, doesn't go against what your mom and dad are telling you, <laughs> consider the source, you know. But it, it, if you don't go into this career path that you go, you, you know, you, you originally studied to, that's okay. Don't beat yourself up about that. It's just a, it's just a tool in your toolkit to broaden your learning and to, and to, get, to get better. And parents, if you have a son or daughter who you send them to school and they don't have a show a desire to learn, then cut it off. By the way, school's not for everybody. But brothers and sisters, what the Proverbs is telling us here is invest your time and energy in those who want to learn, in those who want to grow, in those who want to be value adders. Proverbs 18, verse 2 says, Fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinion. We're seeing a lot of that, aren't we, on social media? You know, even Jesus counseled in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, he says, Don't throw your pearls to swine. Translation, save your breath. And instead, focus your energy on those who want to learn. So again, hear me clearly. I'm not suggesting that you only invest your time and energy with the elite. I'm not suggesting for you to avoid trying to help people change their foolish ways. And really, as parents, isn't that our responsibility? To Sometimes we have to beat our kids to, I mean, sometimes we have to strongly encourage our kids, right, to correct them, to get them to change our ways. That's our responsibility as parents, to help our kids learn and grow. So I'm not suggesting you avoid trying to help people change, but what I am promoting and what I think the Bible is very clear on is to be prudent about how much of your time and your energy you give to those who want to grow and learn. So here's how I, I'm going to close on this. Here's how I personally try to balance this tension. Now how do I invest my time and energy in those who want to learn and yet not avoid those who maybe need a hand up, an opportunity? And I think I've talked about this in the past. I practice every week what I call five-minute favors. Five-minute favors. Let me explain. This is my way to really try to help people in an intentional way. In my schedule every week, I a lot, and I'm very kind of anal on this, but or maybe anal's not the right word. Maybe it's just more uh, what I've learned. But I try to offer, at least have two hours in my schedule in my week to allow myself to be, offer people what I call five-minute favors. I'm very goal-oriented. I wake every up every morning, and some of you are wi wired this way as well, that I have a clean slate. It doesn't matter what I did yesterday. It, it doesn't matter. Today, I have to start brand new. And so I got to accomplish something new today on my to-do list, regardless of what I did yesterday. That's just how I'm wired. And so I'm usually trying to work towards something. I'm usually trying to grow something. And it might just be, okay, I want to read my Bible. That might be the win for the day, right? But at least I'm growing. I'm putting myself in a position where I can grow and learn every single day. But I also have, this, have learned that I want to help people. I want to offer my resources to people. And so I, in order to sort of manage this, save my breath, focus on those people who want to learn, I have two hours that I allow myself to have five-minute favors. So when I get a phone call and say, hey, Mike, can you help me with this, whatever this is? I'll go, yeah, I can help you with that. Even though I know there's going to be no return on investment. Right? Hey, Mike, can you... Can you, can you uh, Talk to me about, you know, I need some counseling, you know, and I'm, I already know it's not going to go anywhere. I'm just, I'm just giving up an hour of my time to you because I know you, you haven't responded in to my count, the last counseling I gave you, right? So why would I want to give you another hour of my time because you haven't followed through on what I already told you, encouraged you to do last time? So I'll give you maybe 15 minutes. And what, that, what, the, what it does is when I get to the end of my two hours of five-minute favors, that's it, so then when somebody from, maybe they come and they say, hey, Mike, can you help me with this? I'll go, nope, I can't, I'm sorry. Next week I can. Because in my mind, next week I got a two, two hours of five-minute favors. Right? I can't do it today. I will help you. I just can't do it right now. Because what I, what I want to do is I want to focus my time and energy on those who want to learn. 
I don't want to just fill up my schedule with, with the, the, the first person that calls me to say, hey, can you help me? Because you guys get calls all the time, right? I need to have some space in my life. So not to pull out, I'm just going to call out Cole, you know, or, or Hunter who are coming from college and they're, they're dealing like, like, what do I want to do? And how do I deal with my mom and dad and the pressure of life, you know, and college students where if Morgan calls me and she's going, Mike, I'm at Estancia High School and I'm a sophomore and I'm think, thinking about this decision. I want to make sure I have time in my schedule to go and respond and spend time with Morgan. Are you with me? Instead of just filling up my schedule with all these commitments with people who don't want to learn. And so it's not that I'm not helping people. It's just that I'm, I'm being very intentional about focusing my time and my energy on those that want to have time. So that when they do call, I can say, yes, I have time for you. Are you with me? That's what the Bible is telling us here. Church, when dealing with foolish people, certainly share some of your time with them, but understand that you likely won't get any kind of a return. Which is likely why the Bible writer counsels us to save our breath and to focus our energy on those who want to learn. And this, my friends, is wisdom to live by. Let's close in prayer. So again, hands open, heart open, mind open. Pray this in your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, please increase my discernment to differentiate between the wise and the foolish. God, please help me to proactively invest your kingdom in resources into those who want to grow and learn. God, I want my life to make a difference. And I recognize that my time and my energy is limited. So, Father, please help me to be someone who is teachable, not foolish. And please help me this week to steward wisely my time and resources. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said, amen.